The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 12, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, every once in a while, I remember going through Bible Institute, and my pastor told us, us preacher boys, that you know what? That pulpit is is not to be used for a whipping stone, a whipping block, but it's it's to be used as an operating table. And you use that Word of God that's sharper than any two-edged sword to cut some things out of our lives. And that's exactly what we were, we were trying to get the point across last night. And I, again, appreciate everybody being here that was here last night and those new faces tonight. Uh, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4. That's our, our text verse that we're going to uh, jump off with again tonight and continue on in the study about the human heart. Amen. And again, I, I, I truly believe it's a needful thing in our day and age. Amen. So uh, we appreciate you being here. Uh, before we read, we're going to pray. So just a sec. Let's pray. Father, thank you again that, God, we can be in the house uh, of God here tonight. And thank you, Lord, for, again, this church, the testimony it's been over all these years. God, I pray you you just please, this preaching time has come. We thank you for this book that you've given us. And I pray, God, through the Holy Spirit of God, you'd open up all of our understanding to this scripture. That, God, you'd speak to our hearts. And that, God, you'd do a work in our lives that wouldn't be just for tonight, but it would be for, from this point on in our, our life here on this earth, that our lives would truly honor and glorify thee. God, I pray you'd get me out of the way. I pray again that you wouldn't let me do anything, say anything that would hinder you from working in the hearts of your dear people. And please, Holy Spirit of God, we just ask that you just descend again into this auditorium, have your will and way, have your free reign in our lives, and we'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, because out, for out of it are the issues of life. Notice it says, keep thy heart. You know, a lot, of, a lot of times as Christians, we try to keep somebody else's heart. You don't need to worry about somebody else's heart. You need to worry about your heart first. Amen. I know, I, listen, as, a, as a, 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 a saved man, I'm responsible before God at the judgment seat of Christ for my Christian life. I'm also responsible as a husband of my wife, the par- uh, uh, as a parent of my children, as a pastor of the church God's allowed me to serve him in. But my point is, if my heart's not right, nothing else is going to be right. And, and we looked at a lot of scripture, not, not all the scripture, but a lot of scripture last night about what the Bible talks about, the, n- the natural heart. Amen. And here it says that we're to keep thy heart with all diligence because out of it are the what? The issues of life. We said that that word issue means personal problems or difficulties. And most of the time, those difficulties or problems are self-inflicted in a lot of ways. Come on, let's be honest with ourselves. You know, God made us free moral agents. And a lot of times we'll make a choice and it's not based on scripture. It's based on reasoning. It's based on, you know, public opinion or our own likes or dislikes. And those choices we make, if they're not scriptural, tend to lead us down the wrong path that cause problems in our life. And, and, and if our heart's not right, we're going to have issues, aren't we? According to the word of God, right? And, and so we start off here. Look at Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 19, it says, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Let me say, the way isn't the way of the world. The way isn't the way that your flesh wants to go. If you're saved by the grace of God tonight, the way of that God wants us to go and live is in that narrow way. And it's about that narrow. Whatever God says in his book, we're to live according to this book. But it says there that we're to guide thine heart in the way. Why? Because just like we saw last night, our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. If we don't guide our hearts by the word of God, it's going to go the wrong way. Listen, some of you might have gotten saved early on in life and then kind of fell away and went your own way. You know what you were doing? Your heart got away from God. You started going your way and God had to reel you back in to get him, get you on, on his way for your life. Look at Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26. It says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a...
Listen, you know what? I, 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 you know, this is the second time I pastored a church. I pastored for eight and a half years in Nova Scotia. Uh, you know, I served in my in in a church down in Stanford, Connecticut, for 14 years. Went to Canada, came back, served two years in a troubled girls' home, ministering to troubled girls. Uh, moved to Delaware for two years, help a church start there. We've been up in in, in uh, 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 Trevitt, Maine, at Bars Island Baptist Church for ten and a half years. You know what I've seen Christians do? Foolish things. They go opposite of what God's word teaches. You're a parent here tonight. You better raise your kids according to how God says. Hey, hey, if you're a parent, be a parent, not a friend to your kids. What your what you need, what your child needs is a parent to teach that to teach that child. No, to do what's right, not be a buddy buddy. I'll say it again tonight. Love y'all. Amen. Amen. So those those other two uh, verses in Proverbs seem to reinforce the truth of we need to keep our hearts with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. And again, we we talked last night about a lot of scriptures relating to the human natural or natural heart or that heart of a person that's saved, but that has gotten away from God and and has quenched the Holy Spirit in their life. And and listen what God has seen fit to record in his holy word, the Bible, should indeed cement in our minds the important need of that statement that's made in uh, Proverbs 4.23, keep thine own heart with diligence. It's not something that we do haphazardly. It's not something that we do periodically. It's not something that we do on a Sunday when we come to church or a Wednesday night prayer meeting. It's something we better do every day of the rest of our Christian life because if we don't, we'll start sliding the wrong way. So that'll never happen. Listen, you talk to some people that have been in the ministry for a while. It happens all the time. Well, it won't happen to me. You got your head in the sand. And I'm just thankful. Listen, you, you go back to Genesis chapter 2. Now you think about this. Here's God. He creates the heavens and the earth, right? Everything's perfect. He creates man out of the dust of the, uh, the ground, breathes into him the breath of life. He becomes a living soul. He creates all the animals and all that. And then he creates Eve, gives him, uh, Eve, uh, Eve to him, right? Perfect environment. Perfect, everything they needed was right there. One commandment, don't eat of that one tree. And you know what happened? Adam made the wrong choice, and we're paying for that 6,000 plus years ago, later. But in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, you know what God told Adam to do? To keep the garden. And you know, a lot of times we think of that, and he said, well, you know, he's the guy in charge. He was the gardener. He was the husband. And he had to trim the, this. He had to do There was no weeds yet, amen? And, and so he had to prune and do this and do that. How about keeping his house? How about keeping his heart? Maybe he was maybe he's too worried about the fruit on the trees and wasn't worried about his wife's uh, relationship with God. So when the devil shows up, she got to see. And then when she comes to him and with that that fruit and says, hey, you want you want some fruit? And he had to make a choice between her and God. Maybe he wasn't keeping his own heart right either. So this thing about keeping your heart with all diligence because out of, the, out of it are the issues of life. It's something real important in your life. You're saved by the grace of God. And by the way, if you're here tonight and you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when you die and take your last breath on earth, you're going to wind up in heaven. The Bible says that you may know if you have eternal life. I'm going to tell you what, this is the best place you can be tonight is under the preaching of the word of God. You're a sinner. You're on your way to hell. And the only way you're going to escape that is trusting the person of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for you personally. And you better fall on your knees and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save your soul, repenting of your sin, humbly asking Jesus Christ to save you. If you got a problem, if, if, if you're not sure about where you're going to spend eternity, you see myself or Brother Herb or, or his dad or somebody else, you Christians that can lead somebody to the Lord, Brother Steve back there. Hey, listen, you need to be saved. You better get that settled because you don't know if you got the end of this day. And if you're here tonight as a saved person, you need to be concerned of your heart. We went through a whole lot of things yet last night about what that, that natural heart of that heart that's away from God's all about. Amen. And as, as we continue that study on the human heart, you, you, and, and I guess I, if I had a title the whole series, 
I'd say it's this, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Now uh, listen, you think about something, you go uh, uh, back in the Old Testament, we're introduced to David, he's a young boy, he becomes the second uh, king of Israel, he's anointed as a king, he's a, take care of daddy's sheep, and you know, he's the last in line of seven boys, and you know, the run, the litter couch kind of, kind of thing, and God raises him up, makes him king of Israel. In the book of Acts, he says he's a man after God's own heart. And yet you go back in Samuel and, and, and what's going on? He's king and he sees some woman at night bathing herself and he lusts after her. He, ha he takes her to himself, has a relationship with her. She has a baby. He tries to hide. So adultery, he tries to hide it, tries to cover it all up, tries to make things look like they are not. Finally, he, he has conspired that that woman's husband is killed in battle. He's a murderer. Nathan comes to him and he says, you know what? This is, gives him a big, long story. And, and the, David gets infuriated and Nathan says, you know what? You're the man. And one of the things I believe why God calls him a man after his own heart, because even as a king and that prophet could have got killed that day, instead of getting mad, he said, you know what? God, you got me. But turn to Psalm 51. And Psalm 51, God had the Holy, the Holy Spirit, God had David pen down these words after Nathan had come to him and how he had sinned. And in verse number 10, it says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Last night, we used the word of God to do some cutting. I hope, I hope your heart's desire after you heard the message and after that last, we, we had the invitation that truly you've been asking God to search your heart to see if there's something wrong. Because listen, your heart will deceive you that you're okay. I, well, Brother Scott, I was, I'm in church on a Tuesday night again, and I, you know, I got the right Bible and this and that. Hey, you praise the Lord, but your heart still can be not right with God. David, after he sinned, got right with God, and he had a desire to have his heart changed. He had a desire, and he cried out to God. He said, create me in what? A clean heart. He wanted his heart to change. He wanted his heart to be different than it was. He acknowledged his sin in the previous verses. He understood that his heart wasn't right. And he got it right with God. And now he's crying out and saying, God, I need my heart to change. But God, I can't do it myself. There's not a whole lot of good in self-reformation. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. So tonight, I want to use the word of God, not so much to cut and hurt and cut away. I want to use the word of God to implant some things into our lives that we can ask God to change our heart into. And what I'd say here tonight is these verses would, would describe what, a, what a, a renewed heart would be. So we're going to just go through, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 19. And... When I first took the church 10 and a half years going up there in Barters Island, there was a guy there that was holding down the fort. He was a deacon of the church, and, and uh, they asked me to come. They voted me in, and, and uh, about a month, month and a half in, into being the pastor of the church, he came to me and said, you know what? You use too much Bible. Amen. I mean, what do you want me to use? Encyclopedia Britannica? I mean, uh, what do you want me to do? I, I mean, come on. Uh, you, you understand? And, and you know what that was? It was a heart problem. If you've got a problem with too much Bible, there's definitely a heart problem. Because you don't need to hear from this fat, ugly guy from Canada or Maine. What you need to hear is from God tonight through his word and the Holy Spirit of God. So in 2 Chronicles chapter number uh, 19, verse number 3, it says this. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and has prepared thine heart to seek God. We kind of, and, and some of this we kind of talked about last night, but you understand the necessity to prepare our hearts to seek after God? 
It's not just the, something that we can just flip a switch and go after. Hey, God, I, I remember, and I, listen, I grew up in a Lutheran church. I got saved as, in a Lutheran church. And I remember as at 15 years old, we had to go through these confirmation classes with the, with the pastor. And, and man, all my childhood, uh, you know, memories are tied around that church. My parents were, were uh, you know, involved and so on and so forth. And I, the, the pastor of the church, um, and, and again, didn't know what I know now. I was going apostate, but, but he was a preacher. He wore wire rim glasses, crew cut haircut and and stuff, and, and to me, he was the epitome of what a Marine Corps drill sergeant would, would be. And if a parent wouldn't take care of their kids in a service, he would. And I loved that man. And then about 15, 16 years old, after we made our confirmation, he took off and with the church secretary, who was not his wife, and stole five grand. That was a lot of money back then, still a lot of money today. But that, that just broke everybody. I didn't want to go back to church. My parents got, fell out of church. And, and you know, it's hard when, when something like that happens to try and seek after God. Because there's bitterness in our hearts towards God. But there's things in our, our life that, hey, we got to get past and we got to get over. And we got to prepare our hearts and say, God, I want to come and see you. I, I just, bro, Brother Cox, when we were praying before church. And, and just, he was praying how God just wants to fellowship with us. Isn't that such a blessing that there's this God who's holy, perfect, and righteous that wants to fellowship with somebody like us? And let's be honest with ourselves. We're saved by the grace of God, but we still sin, don't we? And why in the world we, we have that privilege, we have that right through the blood of Jesus Christ, but I'll never understand, just like Brother Cogswell said. So when we want to seek God, we better make sure and our hearts are right in order to seek him. And we'll get into that as we go on. You know, you go to the book of Ezra and you got a book of Ezra that's named after him. But he doesn't show up till se uh, chapter seven. Zerubbabel comes back and they start build, rebuilding, the, laying a foundation and, te and the temple and so on and so forth. And in chapter seven, Zer uh, Ezra shows up, is, starts being talked about. And you know what he, he was doing? He, was, he wanted to seek after the Lord. He's, doing, he's, got a, he's got a heart to seek after God. You know what? We got a world out there that wants to seek out knowledge. Think about the internet and all the, the, the information you can gain from that. But you know what nobody wants to do? They don't want to seek after God. You ever think about, and again, I'll, I'll just hit it again. If you're saved by the grace of God, you shouldn't have anything to do with Halloween. Why? Because in a couple of weeks, everybody becomes more and more enamored with supernatural things. You know what? Read the Bible. You want supernatural? It's the real deal. I mean, come on. The Red Sea parted. They walked on dry land. Water came out of a rock every day. They had man on the, on the ground. You want to talk about supernatural? But they'll go after all that junk and dismiss this. I'm just saying, you know what? If we're going to have the right kind of heart. We've got to have a heart that seeks after God. Now listen, I under, and, and let me say it again, I appreciate you being here on Tuesday night. You folks have gone, had to go to work and had to rush home and change and shove food down your throat, amen. And I understand all that and I appreciate you being here. But don't think just being here gets you into the throne room of God. We need to seek after God by preparing our hearts to to, to go into that, that throne room, that very presence of God. Like I said last night, my heart's desire is not just to come to church, but that the God, the Holy Spirit of God drops in his place and does something in our life. That's not just good for a night or a day or a week or a month, but next year, if the Lord should tarry five years, hey, you know what? Our hearts are better than they used to be. Psalm chapter 57, let's go there. Psalm 57. I remember years ago, we were in Connecticut, uh, going to church in, there in Stanford, and my wife and I, family, we were living in a house up in Fairfield, Connecticut. We were going to church down to Stanford, and this young guy, this young Texan guy, came to church. And he's kind of thin, tall, wiry guy, 
half crazed Texan kind of thing. Hope nobody's here from Texas. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You're, you're not from Waco. Where, uh, yeah, well, he was. <laughs> I used to call him Waco, the Wacko the, from Waco. Amen. And that boy, he got, he got saved. But you know what his Christian life was? A roller coaster. A roller, uh, his life was, as a Christian, was like a roller coaster, and it was all tied to a girl he had his eye on. You know what the Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 8? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And every time I think about it, I think, I, I, I think about that verse, I, I picture him. Because one day he'd be riding high, and the next day he was lower than low. And you know what? You and I need a heart that's fixed on God. Listen, I don't know what's going to happen in a couple of weeks in the midterms or next, in 2024. I know, you know, everybody wants change, change, change. Yeah, I, I agree. You know what, what, what people need is not being fixed on politics, not being fixed on the economy, but having your heart fixed on the God of all glory. Amen. In Psalm chapter 57, look, look at verse number seven. It says this, my heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed, and I will sing and give praise. You know what? You know what? It, it, it amazes me that, and I, I think I said this last night, that we'll entrust our most precious thing we have, our eternal soul to God by faith, and then we have a hard time living by faith till we get to heaven. And when something starts happening, it's, oh, God, what have you done? God, you forgot me. God, what are you doing in my life? And I know that's not you. That's me. You know what that is a problem there? Our heart's not fixed on God. Because when Peter stepped off the side of that ship in the storm, he was fine keeping his eyes on Jesus. But when he put his eyes on the circumstances, that's when he started to sink. You know what we need to do? Just fix our heart on God. Keep, again, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto the, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Why? Because that's the only thing that's steady. I thank God he's a God that never changed the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. I thank God this book has never changed in all the years it's been in print. It's the same when it was God gave it through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and God preserved it. And we need to fix our hearts on God. Now I understand I got a lot of responsibilities. I got a lot of problems in my life. I understand that, but go and, and get a hold of God. Let God get a hold of you so he'll pull you through those hard times. But when we get our hearts on everything else, listen, I can't love my wife right, I can't love my kids right, my grandkids, my, my church family, one another as brother and sister in Christ, unless I love God right. And, and let me ask you ladies, if your husband, if, you got, if you're uh, married and your husband was unfaithful to you and had affections for someone else, wouldn't you feel upset about it? My wife's Italian. I'd just be dead. Period. How do, you, how do you think God is when we, we don't fix our lives, our hearts on God, and he's the one that saved us. He's the one that sent his son on that cross, shed his blood so we could have forgiveness of sins. And then we commit spiritual idolatry and adultery on him and say, no, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there and fix my heart on all these other things. I'm just saying our hearts need to be fixed on God. Settled, established, firm, fast, stable. You know, I, 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 Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said before he's ascended, he, he's telling his believers, he said, ye shall be a, a witnesses unto me, right? Ye shall be witnesses. And I always thought about it this way. Either we're going to be a witness one way or the other. Either we're going to be a good one or a bad one. And you know what? If somebody's not fixed on God and they're not settled in their Christianity you don't think people see that I got a tragedy in my life and I'm, I'm giving up on God you don't think your neighbor knows or your co-worker sees that I guess that person's Christianity is about skin deep and people lost people see it I'm just saying you know what a renewed heart is a heart that seeks after God or a renewed heart is fixed on God. And because you're, you're seeking God, you're fixed on God, you know what a renewed heart ought to be? Joyful. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I am not a morning person. My, my girls, 
buy me t-shirts. I had, I had one on the other day when I got to Herb's house. That big across the front, it's in orange, it says, warning, anything you say may be used in a sermon illustration. Because I'm always using my girls as illustration and then I got to hear it afterwards. So I'm not supposed to say anything about what they do. But they used, years ago, they gave me one, you know, one of the seven drunk, uh, dwarfs grumpy. I'll be honest. I'm just being honest with you. Sometimes I'm just, uh, ask my wife. She's here. I can be a bear to live with. And I believe it all stems from the fact that my heart's not right with God. And because it's not right with God, I'm not joyful like I ought to be. Listen, I don't care what happens in this world. I'm going to die and go to heaven someday. I may, I may get sick and go through all, whatever it might be. But ultimately, you know, I may get in a car wreck. And ultimately what? I'm going to go to heaven. Wow, that's something to threaten me with. Why shouldn't we be joyful? Because our hearts aren't keyed into the one who gives us that joy, and that's the God of heaven, the God who saved our soul. Listen, the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 61, again, I'm not going to go in all these because we don't, we don't have time, and we're Baptists, and there's food downstairs. But you know what? We ought to try and keep our hearts perfect with God. I believe, I, honestly, I believe that, you know what? We're saved by the grace of God, but we're still not sinless. The penalty for our sin was paid on the cross of Calvary. As long as we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we ought to keep a perfect heart before God. When we do sin, we need to get it right with God right away. And we were talking about Brother Restep. I know if you ever heard him say this, keep your account short with God. Why? Because you don't know. I mean, listen, I might drop dead of a heart attack. Somebody say amen, you know. Get, get rid of that fat old guy up there. I'm just saying, hey, you don't know what today's going to end up with in your life. You need to make sure your heart's right with God all the time. And, he, and, and as God reveals it, you better do something about it. And then like the preacher said last night, you ought to obey what God tells you to do. The human heart, the renewed heart, it should be joyful, be perfect, be upright. And that's again, that, that not necessarily sinless perfection, but doing all God commanded. Think about something. Go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. By the way, this new Christianity that says God will save me and loves me so much I can live the life I want to live, that's not scripture. That's not Bible. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There ought to be a change. And listen, I understand, not everybody changes, not everybody grows at the same rate and, the same, and, and so on and so forth, but there ought to be something different. If the God of all glory takes residence inside of you in the person of the Holy Spirit, something ought to change. So, in Luke chapter 1, we're introduced to Zacharias and Elizabeth. They're going to be the parents of John the Baptist. Look at verse number six. It says, and they were both righteous before God, work, walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And we take the Bible in its entirety. It says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? So this guy, Zacharias, and his wife, Elizabeth, they were sinners just like you and I. But they walked blameless before God because everything God required of a Jew to do for his sins, they did. So you know what? We need to be upright in the fact that we need to do everything we're supposed to do to get the cleansing of sin. You know, far too much of Christianity sweeps sin under the carpet. Far too much of professing Christianity is, 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 is not condemning sin, but embracing sin and saying it's okay. I drive around up, up in Maine and you see all these churches affirming congregation, meaning come as you are, sin as you want, and God loves you. Now, if anybody knows their Bible, that's not the God of the Bible. I mean, they wanted to teach, you know, uh, gay and lesbian history. Why don't you start with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? 
Think about it. You say, you're mean-spirited, you're homophobic. No, they need to be saved just like I need to be saved. But I'm not going to embrace their sin just to appease their conscience. And listen, my sin might be, what? Covetousness. It's just as bad as that is. Because in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, it says liars and murderers shall all go to the lake of fire, right? God says a liar and a murderer, they're in the same boat. Problem is, is we as, as, as humans want to categorize sin and say, well, I'm not, I'm not that bad. I didn't murder anybody. But that little white lie is still a lie in God's eyes and he's going to hold people responsible. We need to be, have an upright heart. And again, these kind of flow together, but a clean heart. Listen, uh, I know we have to live in this world, but we don't have to be of this world. There was an old preacher about 10 years before I got to, the, to Barters Island Baptist Church that was the interim pastor, he, they, people tell me. His name was, was Greenwood. He was an older guy in the 70s. And um, he would fill a pulpit. And uh, he, he had a physical at 73, I think it was. Three days later, he dropped dead and went to war. But he had a saying. He said, you know what? The boat's got to be in the water, but the water don't have to be in the boat. And a lot of times we allow things in our life and they're not clean. In Psalm 73, verse 1, it says, Truly God is good to Israel, even as such as are, as are of a clean heart. Again, that, that whole idea of keeping your heart right with God, confessing your sin, doing what's right. So I, I, I don't like telling anybody, you don't have to tell a soul, you just got to tell God about it. And yet, it seems like we have gotten into this mentality that, you know what, that little sin in my life, that little bit of jealousy, that little bit of unforgiveness. Because that unforgiveness that's left turns to bitterness, and that's like a cancer that'll eat you up on the inside. Aren't we commanded to forgive one another because we've been forgiven by God through Jesus Christ? So I, I don't want to forgive them. I understand it's supernatural to forgive somebody, and especially when they don't ask for, for, the, for, for the forgiveness. You know, I've come across a lot of bitter Christians, and you start talking to them, you know what, somebody wronged them, another Christian, and you know what, they're bitter about it. I'm not saying it's easy. I, I, listen, think about it. Think about how Jesus Christ hung on that cross and said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He had forgiveness in his, on his lips just the last breath on this earth as a human being. You know what? You and I are supposed to forgive. And if we don't, you know, we got a good chance of our hearts not being clean. You know, we can get rid of the out, outward sin that everybody sees, but the sins of the heart that, that nobody else knows about but you and God... And we can push him down and push him down and say, I'm not dealing with that. God wants you to deal with it. Now, let me say this. I don't think I'm out of line. If I am, Pastor, uh, uh, forgive me. But if during the course of the message, you need to come to an old-fashioned altar and do business with God, you're not going to offend anybody. But let me say, if you're thinking, well, I'm not going to go up there. People think badly of me. You better worry about what God thinks about you. Listen, we're all in the same boat. We're just sinners saved by grace. We all got our own problems. Mine may be different than yours. Yours might be different than mine. But you know what our, 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 our heart's desire ought to be? That our heart is as clean before God as it can be. When, when I told you about being a Lutheran church and, and at 15 we went through confirmation classes and you went through those classes with the pastor and after that you were able to partake of the Lord's table. Well, back then, I don't know now because I haven't been there in a long, long time, but they would actually, the pastor would have a, um, a golden chalice filled with a silver lining, and they would actually put w real wine in the chalice. And you'd kneel at a railing, and he'd come down, and first they'd give you the wafer, and he'd come back again, and, and he'd give you the, the, um, the a sip of wine. He'd wipe it and go to the next person. He'd say, that's gross. Well, the silver supposedly, with the alcohol and the silver, it would always cleanse it. I'm not sure that's true or not, but 
I remember he took us into the, the sanctuary and he was going to go through a practice run for Sunday, you know, so we all, you know, didn't look, look like jerks not doing the right thing. And he's going down a line, and, and all of a sudden, everybody's, you know, he's going from one end to the other. Everybody's squirming and this and that. Well, it's because in the chalice, there was a dead bug inside. It looked beautiful on the outside. It was ornate on the outside. And yet, on the inside, where not, not too many could, buddy, uh, not anybody outside could see, there was something in there that was gross. Is there something in your heart tonight that God thinks is gross? What do you look at on the internet when nobody else is looking? On your phone, what are you listening to that once you leave and you're by yourself and nobody else is around? What thoughts are you having in your head that emanate from your wicked heart? I'm just saying, you know what a renewed heart is? A heart that's clean before God. And my wife, my, like I said, my wife, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to embarrass you. But, you know, I had a good, I had a good mother-in-law. She trained my wife how to cook. I got a pretty wife and one that could cook and clean. When my mother-in-law cleaned, you remember years ago, you used to go to a hotel or motel and on a toilet, it had a strip of paper over it and said, like, sanitize or something? That was my mother-in-law, man. She cleaned and cleaned and cleaned. She was constantly cleaning. Amen. And we kind of take it for granted how much our heart needs to be clean. Because if it's desperately wicked, that must mean it gets dirty fairly often, which means we need to have it clean. Amen? Again, a pure heart, Psalm 24, 4. That means honestly wanting God and godliness. I hope you're here not tonight not to impress me or the pastor or anybody else, but you're looking for God to have a closer relationship with him. That you want, really want, and, and you know what? I, when, when, again, when, I, when we were in Stanford for 14 years, I was supposed to become the associate pastor and God called me to go to Nova Scotia and start a church. And, you know, honestly, I was, you know, at 45 years old, I was full of zeal and my first ministry, you know, on my own. And I, you know, felt like I was going to charge hell with a gas can. And I'm going to go and preach the truth to a bunch of people in Barrington, Nova Scotia. And after eight and a half years, I walked away. And I, you know what I found out? Most people don't want the truth. You know why? Because the truth is going to change you. Did not the truth change you when you got saved? Made you, took you from being a child of the devil to a child of God? Amen? I, this book demands change. And then we, again, cue, that clean, that upright, that pure, wanting God and godliness. You young people, you kids, you parents, you're teaching these kids this world has nothing to offer them. And you know what, if nothing else, some of you older people have the marks, the scars, the hurt, the suffering that, that the world did to you. You ought to pass that knowledge on to these young people so they don't make the same mistakes you did. Because this world's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Let me say this, 1 Samuel, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. In verse number, verse number 5. It says here, and it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he cut off Saul's skirt. Saul's the king of Israel. He's been chasing after David, trying to kill him and wipe him out because Saul knows that David's going to be the next king. And, and David has, God's given him opportunity. He could take out his enemy and kill him. And you know what? He, does, he said, I'm not going to touch God's anointed, but I'll cut off the corner of his skirt just to show him I could have killed him. And you know what happened? It smote his heart. You know what that tells me David had? A tender heart. We live in a world that breeds and ex ex exasperates people's hearts so that they become 
cold and hard and unsensitive and just don't want to don't want to be talked to or talked down to or or have to move in any one direction why because it's hard hardness and here's david he's a man after god's own heart did he sin yeah he messed up he sinned later on in his life but you know what he had he had a tender heart god give us tender hearts not like this world that's hard, that, that wants to just rebel at the things of God and rebel at Jesus Christ and rebel at the Bible. But a heart that's tender, that whatever God speaks to our hearts about, we'll give in to Him. Listen, we can go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. It says we're to be tender hearted, right? So it's New Testament doctrine too. That idea of being penitent. But let me say something. I believe a tender heart is a heart that's teachable. We live in a day and age where there's arrogancy and pride where you can't tell me anything. When, when you have a heart that way, your heart is heart, it's not tender, and God's not gonna have God's gonna have a hard time getting a hold of your heart. Because you don't want God to get a hold of your heart. And we need hearts that are tender, that are open to the word of God, that God can speak to. And, and if God, li listen, I don't know, Ken, right? And, and I'm using him as, I don't even know him. Met him last night, talked to him a little bit. I have no idea. What if, what if Sunday he's sitting in his church and the Holy Spirit of God says, Ken, I want you to pack up your bags and go to some third world country to preach the gospel. Now, he's got a choice to make. He's got a choice to either do what he wants to do or with a tender heart say, here I am, Lord, send me. I was 45 years old, had a decent job down in, in, in uh, Greenwich, had a nice house in Norwalk, amen, uh, had a good church to go to. I was serving in the ministry. I do, I, and again, I was supposed to be the associate pastor uh, the following year. And God started dealing with my heart about going to Canada and Nova Scotia and starting to work. And I could have said, I ain't going. I'm not going. I'm going to do what I'm doing. When we were down in Delaware, we moved up from Florida, and the, the, the preacher was starting a new work. And he didn't, you know, the, he didn't have, there's a new church start. He had a handful of people that were going to get on board, but, you know, he's, it's a long story about the situation, but he wasn't going to be supported. He couldn't have me come in as, a, as an associate and support me. I would had to get, get a job. So we went down there. We saw each other in a meeting, went down there and saw what was going on. He said, pray about it. A week later, he says, hey, how about a, a job in a senior center uh, as an office manager? I said, okay. We've been praying about it, and God opened the door for me to support my family. And God, you know, so... We went up there, got, uh, we went for an interview, and they offered me the job right on the spot. And we had a week, right, a week to move from Florida to Delaware with our stuff because that's how fast they wanted me to start. I started as an office manager. I was there for a little over two years. I, at, at about, I think it was one year, six months, nine months, the executive director left. They made me appointing uh, 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 acting executive director to run the whole place and then just a, about a week before I, I, I handed in my resignation, they, they gave me the job permanently with a, big, a, a good raise. Had a good church right across the street, ministry to go in, had a place to stay, had everything I needed. And God says, I don't want you there. I want you to go to Barters Island Baptist Church. There's a handful of people, and there's not a lot of money, so you're going to have to rely on me, son. And you know what I needed to have? A tender heart to say yes, God. How's your heart tonight? Because I'm going to tell you something. This world will make your heart hard and cold to God. And you need to be in this book and on your knees praying, always asking God for that heart that's tender, that God can speak to, that God can point, put his finger on and say, I need you to do this. But it takes the right kind of heart. Amen. You know, something else in the book of Psalms, Book of Psalms, chapter number 34.
Psalm 34, look at verse number 18. It says here, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save as such as are be of a contrite spirit. You're never going to have a tender heart unless you let God break, and break your heart and you, have, you develop that contriteness in your heart. I said last night, we live in America, and America has become a, a, a country full of pride, 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 pride. Look at me. Look at what I can do. You say, that's not the case. Why do we have so much social media? I don't care what you did yesterday. I got enough problems of my own. I don't, and listen, some people are into that. They want to plaster everything all over. That's between you and God. But you know what? There ought to be a broken, and I believe a lot of social media is, is, is really motivated by a, a, a spirit of pride. Look at me, look at me, look at me. You know what God's looking for? A broken and contrite heart. Just a humble heart. This is the heart that, you know what, man, I don't know about you, but you know, I, I, I got saved when I was about uh, six or seven or seven or eight years old in that, in that Lutheran church in the basement. And you know what? I, my wife and I, she was raised Roman Catholic. We got married in a Catholic church. She got saved about six years after, and she started growing. God started dealing with my heart. We started getting faithful at a, a, a Bible-believing church, so on and so forth, and growing. I'm going to tell you something. You know what I've learned after all these years? I need God more today than I've ever needed. I need God just to make my head straight. I need, I need God just to guide and direct me on simple things of life, amen? And you know what that takes? That takes an, uh, an attitude of humility, one that I'm not proud about who I am. I'm not proud of what I've accomplished because whatever I am, whatever I accomplish, it's God doing it through me. And there needs to that be broken, that contrite heart. Amen. We're in the book of Psalms. Look at verse, uh, chapter 19. Anybody getting hungry yet? I meant hungry for the word of God. Listen, the food won't spoil. You hurt, are, you, are you really looking for God? hungering and thirsting for him with that humble heart but in psalm 19 look at verse number 112 it says here i have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always even unto the end you know what i remember going down south when we went down to help with the girls home we were in Pace, Florida. It was right outside Pensacola. And I had never heard of a, a buffet called Ryan's till we went down there. Anybody remember? You've been, yeah, yeah, you know, brother, right? And it's like, wow, some Baptist must be running this place. I mean, they just, a big old buffet and everything. Man, it was just. And you go through and you can have some of this, some of that, some of this, some of that. That, now nah, I don't want that, but now nah, I don't want that. Here's the psalmist, he said, you know what? I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. You know what he said? He's saying, he said, I'm pick and choose which ones I want to obey and which ones I don't want to. I'm going to just obey all of them. And you know what? I'm going to finish this thing right. And I thank God that Paul, one of the, one of the statements Paul makes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he said, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith, i fought a good fight, right? He's just about to part this earth. And, I, and I, I've always thought, man, that's a, a pretty gutsy thing to say. But first of all, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write that down. So number one, it's true, but it wasn't gutsy. You know what he had confidence in? He had the confidence in his God that, you know what? He was going to be obedient to the end. You know what? Thank God you're saved tonight. Your sins are forgiven. You're going to heaven. You're a child of God. You're serving God. You're in church on a Tuesday night. But let me tell you something. If the Lord should tarry, where are you going to be next month? Where are you going to be next year if the Lord tarries? Where are you going to be if, heaven forbid, America stops uh, Bible-believing preachers to preach this book and this book becomes outlawed in our country? It'll never happen. Do you understand that fundamental Christianity is part of a terrorist list in, in, with Homeland Security in our country, America? So you're already on thin ice with the government. 
But I'm going to tell you something. Our hearts have to be set on the fact that, you know what? I'm going to obey God to the end of this thing. I, I, listen, there's not a one of us that's not, that's not saved here tonight that longs to hear Jesus Christ say to us when we get to heaven, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Can you say amen to that? I mean, let's face it, we want to hear that, but I'm not sure about it sometimes. Not on God's side, I'm, on me. But I'm going to tell you something. If my heart's not obedient to what God tells me to do, hmm, I'm on thin ice with God. I know I'm not going to lose my salvation, but you get what I'm getting at? Our heart has to have a determination. We're going to obey God, come hell or high water. You look at, you know, Peter, what happened? He's in jail, Paul in jail. Why? Because they were being obedient to God. I understand, listen, you know, I don't know what this world's going to come to, but I know one thing, God, God blesses obedience. Turn me to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul is told to wipe out the Amalekites, but he doesn't do it completely. Look at verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delights in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He said, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. You know, for a Jew, if he would just obey God, he didn't have to do all those sacrifices. I don't know about you, but I'd, pr I'd probably need a pretty big herd to sacrifice. But obedience would negate all that. We're talking about keeping our hearts, uh, keep, keep our hearts with all diligence because out of our the issues of life. If we just be, be obedient to God in all things, I think a lot of the issues would just kind of fade away. But it's having a heart of obedience. Amen? A heart... And we're uh, back in Psalm chapter 40, Psalm chapter 40. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 40, verse number 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy laws within my heart. Listen, you, you heard me say last night, you ought to be picking up this book every day and reading it. If you have never taken your Bible, an old King James 16 level Bible, and started from Genesis 1-1 and never read it all the way through to Amen at the, at the last chapter of Revelation, you're, not, you're missing an awful lot of what God has for you. And you're missing out on the strength of God because you're not in his word like you're supposed to. And, and I, we need a heart that's filled with the law of God. I'm going to brag on, on Pastor Herb. This morning we were sitting in, in a living room and he had his Bible, I had my Bible. And little Nathan got up and, and, and I guess Mama brought him to, 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 to his daddy and he, daddy, he's holding him face to face and he starts quoting John 3.16. That blessed this old preacher's heart. Why? Because he's training up a child in the way he should go. But he's a little baby, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So what? I mean, you know what, haven't you, if you, you ladies that have had, had, had uh, uh, babies, haven't you had the father of that baby kind of, or, or you, uh, you know, trying to talk to your stomach, say, hey, baby, I'm here. Right? Isn't that kid need, those, these young kids, you know what they need? They need to be brainwashed with the word of God. They need to be in doctor. Listen, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were Jews brought to a pagan land. You know what that king wanted to do? Indoctrinate them into their paganism. This world wants to indoctrinate these kids into their paganism. And what's not going to offset that is dad and mom in the home filled with the word of God and teaching it to these kids, these little kids. Glory to God. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. It hasn't failed me yet. That heart that's filled with the word of the law of God. In Psalm 119, turn there, and I'm, I'm, I don't know, what time is it, brother? Are we all right? I'm, I, I, I can't see the clock, so it's the clock's fault. Psalm 119, verse 161. It says, princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. 
you know what? This is my Bible. You say, well, I got a King James Bible too, but this is my Bible. This is the Bible that God talks to me by. And we, listen, I, I, have, I don't like putting this down just anywhere. We were doing, we were, Sister Emily, you know, she keeps feeding me. I'm trying to lose weight, amen? My, my wife's a good cook. We got three girls still, uh, still living at home, and our youngest, Elizabeth, is, she's 24, and she loves to bake. Don't, don't, 27, I don't know, she's, she's our baby. And my wife keeps telling me, you gotta lose weight, you gotta lose weight. And then Lizzie goes in the kitchen and bakes something sweet and good, and you know, drives me crazy. I don't know why I said that, getting off course here. Are you in awe of God's word? I mean, you understand, that's what I was getting at. We had to clear the table and I had my Bible and I was about to put it on the floor next to where I was sitting. I said, I'm not putting my Bible on the floor because that's the holy word of God. That's God's love letter to me. And people take this book for granted. And we ought to hold this book in awe. Why? Because it changes our lives. When we were in Canada, uh, I had a guy with me. We were going out door knocking, and uh, our, our church was on Oak Park Road, and it went up a little bit into a, a kind of a dead-end area, and uh, w w there was like one house left, and we go there. It was just about dusk, and uh, knock on the door, and, and uh, I heard a voice inside, come in, and there's this husband and wife, and and Larry was a big, burly old guy, and, white, and Shirley was kind of a, a shorter woman, and, and she had kind of cur curled up hands. She had a, 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 a muscle disorder, and, and she couldn't walk straight or walk really well. And came in there and introduced myself as a pastor of the church and started talking and talk, tried to witness to him about uh, being saved. And she said, you know, we were just talking about what's going to happen to us when we die. Most of those people got saved. And they started coming to church on and off, not real faithful. But, but there was growth there. I bought an old farmhouse doing some renovations. And I'd, I'd go to the hardware store in town and got to know the guys, witness to them. They knew I was a pastor, tried to get them to come to church and all that. And there was one guy, he was a, a shorter guy. His name was Ralph, a counter guy in, in a lumber yard. And, you know, because I was going buying stuff all the time, building materials. We got to talking about a lot. And one day he goes to me, he said, hey, what did, you do, what did you do to Larry Hopkins? I didn't do nothing. I said, but God did something. To him. I never knew the background of Larry until years later. That night that we came to witness to him, that was on the tail end of an argument that they had because he was a drunk. And when we met Larry and all through the time we were up there, Larry was this sweet guy, soft-spoken, just do anything for you. But when he drank, he was a monster. So much so that that little woman with knurled up hands took a steak knife one night and stabbed her own husband to get, her, get him away from her. And one day that, that man that was given to that liquor turned to Jesus Christ and Jesus kept his promise and saved his soul and started changing his life and that no longer did he drink, no longer did he have a bad attitude, a bad attitude and a foul mouth. He, it changed his life, not so much that his wife was the only one that saw it, the people around the community saw it. And you know what? It wasn't his preacher. It wasn't the church he was attending. It was the God of this Bible, the book that God breathed into existence, the one that God preserved for you and I. We ought to keep this book in awe that it is an amazing book. It's an honorable book. It says, Holy Bible. Then treat it that way. Because if we believe this is the very words of God, why aren't we believing and living and obeying every word that's in it? Because we don't have a heart that's in awe of this book that we open it up and say, wow, what's gonna, God's going to show me today? 
Most of the time we go to the Bible and say, God, get me out of this jam. What verse do I need to, to read? This book is a B-I-B-L-E, the basic instruction before leaving earth. Boy, if you take this for granted, you're in trouble. You need a heart that's in awe of the law of God, filled with the law of God. And listen, just thinking about that, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. You know what God told Joshua? He said, meditate on that book night and day. Listen, I understand you've got things you've got to worry about, things you've got to think about, things you've got to get done. But when you have free time, what do you think about? What do you meditate on? Heaven help you, don't stand on your, you don't sit down and go. Because mm. something spiritual happened, but it ain't the spirit of God. Meditate on that book. Hey, these young kids, fill them with the holy, the, the holy word of God. Amen. Teach them the Bible. Let them, li listen. I'm 67 years old, man. I can't remember yesterday. It's hard for me to memorize stuff. But it, it, it irks me to see my little grandkids, and they can memorize everything and everything they do. Why not tell them, you know what, memorize this book so you can meditate, because when you get older, you're going to need it. We need a heart that's filled with the fear of God. Now, I, I, listen, you, you have, listen, I have my own idea about this. I know my God's a loving God because he shows me that love every day. But you know what? I think the fear of God is something like this. I got a God up in heaven that saved me, and he's been good and faithful all these years. And you know what? I'm afraid I'm going to do something to displease him, the one who's been so good to me. I'm afraid in my flesh, in my stupidity, in my arrogancy and rebellion against him. I'm going to do, listen, in, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, doesn't it say that God created all things and they were created for his pleasure? When was the last time you asked God, say, God, what can I do today to make you put a smile on your face? To make you happy with what I do. No, God, hey, get me through this problem. Help me here. Uh, supply this need. Supply that need. Do this. Do that. Hey, God, I just want to make you happy. I just want to make you pleased. I want to put a smile on your face because you've been so good to me. I'm just saying, I think that's, listen, I don't think God's up in heaven just waiting, waiting to say, you know, I'm, can't, that guy can. I'm waiting for him to mess up because I got a baseball bat. I'm going to thump him. That's not my God. We ought to fear him. We ought to have a reverence for him because of who he is and what he's done in our lives, but that we want to please him in every aspect of our lives. And you know what? You know what? The fear of men bringeth a snare. We're not to fear this world. We're not to fear uh, uh, what's going on in this world. Listen, I don't know what's going to happen with the economy, with the politics, with, with you know, gas prices, food prices, inflation. You know, and, and after all, you know, it, he's, the, the politicians are doing a great job. Thank God nobody said amen. I'm just, li listen, we don't need to f fear anything. We're on God's side and he's on our side. If, you know, hey, what's going to, like I said earlier, what's going to happen? We're all going to go die and go to heaven someday? But I'm going to tell you something. You know what? Things might get rough. Things might get to the point where no longer you can meet in a church building. You've got to cheat, uh, meet secretly somewhere because somewhere, the government's after us. And that'll never happen in America. You never thought they'd have same-sex marriages in America 10 years ago. And we don't have to have, we, we, we don't have to have a heart full of fear of the world and, and mu and man, but we ought to have some fear against God. And by the way, I know he's not up there to, that wants to thump us with a, with a rod when we do wrong. But just remember, you're saved by the grace of God. There is the judgment seat of Christ. And that's that God, God says in a word, there's terror at that thing. Because there's going to be a God sitting there that knows all, knows how we did, knows the motives, everything we did or didn't do. And we're going to be judged for that. That ought to put a little fear of God into us. I know we're going to get, we're still saved, we're still going to heaven, all that stuff, but it ought to put some fear in us. How's your life today as a Christian? 
If you had to give an account for your Christian life today, how would you stand at the judgment seat of Christ? Our hearts need, a, a renewed heart is one that's enlarged, that ability to love more. You know what most Americans have a problem with? They love too much. The problem is they love self too much. Think of how many people pamper self and exalt self. God wants our hearts to be enlarged, not for our own good, but that we have more love for other people. Amen? Look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9. We're kind of winding down here, but you get the point, don't you? It's in our heart naturally is not right with God. But you know what? We can have a renewed heart with God helping us, which would be a whole lot better. But it does not come naturally. Amen? Nehemiah chapter 9, verse number 8. It goes on to say here, it says, And found as his heart faithful before thee. You know, in, second, uh, in Corinthians, what, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it's, and verse number 2, it's required in a steward to be found what? Faithful. You know, we use that term Christian real loosely. To be Christian is to be Christ-like. I, pre I believe a person can be saved, but not a Christian. You can be saved by the grace of God, but you're not living a Christ-like life. There's two entirely different things. You know what? God's given this thing. When we're saved, he's, he's given us this thing called Christianity. He's made us ambassadors for Christ, ministers of reconciliation. We ought to, be, we ought to have a faithful heart about it. And, and I commend you. Last night, tonight, you're in church on a Monday, a Tuesday night. The world thinks, well, Sunday's enough. I don't know about you, but I could go to church seven days a week. I'd still have problems. If we're honest with ourselves, why? Because that world gets a hold of us too much. We need to have a heart that's faithful to God. He is our God. He is our Savior. He's the one that done, has done so much for us in, in so many ways. We need to be faithful to him first. In Psalm, in Psalm 112, verse 7, it talks about being confident in God. I'll tell you what, you know what? God's pulled me out of a whole lot of trouble. He didn't have to, but he did. And he's got me down the road a long way in my Christian life. And you know what? I, I, I remember we were, we were living in Fairfield, Connecticut, going to um, a church in Stanford, Connecticut. I had my business. I was working as a firefighter down in Greenwich and had my business in down lower Fairfield County. And... Um, we were having a hard time when the economy went belly up. Um, I, I, had, I had quit the fire department because I wanted to serve God more. I had my side business and it was going well and the economy dropped out. I had a mortgage, I had three kids, a wife, uh, and, and we were having problems. And we didn't have any money. And a woman from our church that didn't have a whole lot of money one day drove 30 miles up the road with a carload of groceries and put them on our back door and left. And the only reason why I knew who it was because I heard her going out the driveway. I looked out the window and saw her car pull. Away. You know what? I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring and what hard hardships this is going to bring, but you know what I am? I'm confident God's going to get me through it. Because God gave me a promise, I'll supply all your needs. Let me tell you, every once in a while, God God will even supply a want. I got a good God. And you know what? He's proven himself to me. You know what I can be? Confident in him. And I thank God that, you know, one day I'm confident I don't deserve it, that one day I'm going to take this last breath on this earth, and by physical death of the rapture of the church, I'm going to heaven. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve to, to have forgiveness of sins. I don't deserve to be a, a son of God. I don't deserve to be able to serve him but all those things, you know what, I'm confident in God that he allows me to do that here, but one day he's going to take me up there. And I know. I've had people say, how can you know? I said, because I've got faith in what God says. You may know if you have eternal life. If you're here tonight, you don't know that. You need to get saved. You need to get it right. Confident in God. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 13. The renewed heart is a prayerful heart. How much do you pray? 
I'm not talking about thank you for this food, bless our bodies, amen. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about going in that closet of prayer and praying. I'm sure it's in your hymnal, sweet hour of prayer. Help me pray five minutes, Lord. I got a, in my office, I got a picture. And on the picture, there's a little boy laying in a bed. And on the far side of the bed, there's a daddy kneeling over him praying. And behind the dad is a window. And outside the window, there's an angel. And, and I know it's not scriptural, white, you know, white fit, a male figure with white wings. And he's got his back to the window. And on the other side of that angel is a black demon trying to get at that little boy. I got a heart for little kids growing up in church. Because I used to work at a troubled girls' home, and I worked with a guy who would work with teens for years. And he told me of a story about a, a, a young boy that was in his bedroom, and his mama, and, and he's playing some computer game, and his mama comes into the bedroom and says, son, you got 15 minutes to get off of that game. He goes, she goes out of that room, 15 minutes later, she comes in the door, and when she opens the door, the son wasn't off the game. He was off the game, rather. But you know what he was doing? Holding a 12-gauge shotgun and put a hole right through her and killed her. That's a terrible thing to do. Yeah, it is. Especially when that kid grew up sitting on the front pew of a Bible-believing Baptist church. I'm telling you, you better pray for these kids. I pray for my kids and they're all grown. Now I got nine grandsons and one on the way. I don't want them. I don't want the world to get them. I don't want the devil to get them. I got five little kids in my church. I pray for them all the time. I don't want, I want God to use them. I want God to protect them. But I'm going to tell you something. It takes some prayer. I always said when, when we were raising our kids, when the kids were little, you know what? You, you know, little kids in the house. Where's Emily? There she is. You know, the kids pull toys over here and toys over there and mama, mama, mama and a mess over here. Well, when they get out, when they get older, it'll be easier. You want to bet? When they're out and out from under your control, you worry twice as much. It ought to make you pray twice as much. But you know what it takes? A renewed heart that says, you know what? Prayer is the only thing that's going to work. And by the way, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Amen? A renewed heart. It's a heart that praise. Amen. It's a heart in Psalm chapter 9 verse 1 that's wholly devoted to God. My wife and I have been married for 45 years. And, and when we, we had our 40th anniversary, our kids made us a plaque. It said 40 years of marriage, um, five kids, nine handsome grandsons. Uh, how many, I, what, how many, 13 different places we lived over the years, so many days. And, and on the bottom it says, I have this saying, I always say we've been married 45 years and we never had a fight that I won. I know it's a joke, but you know what? I'm totally devoted to that woman. She's been faithful to me, I've been faithful to her. Am I a good husband? She could have done better. But I love her more than I have ever loved her when we first, at 16 years old in high school, my high school sweetheart. I'm, I'm embarrassing, I'm sorry. I didn't promise today that I wouldn't embarrass you. She made me promise last night. I'm going to pay for this dearly on the way home. How devoted are you to the God that saved you? As much as I love my wife and as much as my wife loves me, God loves me even more. What's in your heart that has your affection more than God should have? Because the Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Every part of our being, all our affection should be devoted and, and, and channeled towards God first. And then all of our, hey, if our relationship with God this way ain't right, any relation this way isn't going to be right. So that renewed heart is a heart that's totally, wholly devoted to God. It's a, and I'm just going to give you these last two. It's a, it's a one that's zealous. You know, a lot of people, when they first get saved, it's like 
like I said when you know I was going to Canada, let's charge get hell with a gas can. Full of zeal, full of excitement, for you want to do something for God. And then you know what? You got some family, you got some friends, you try and witness to them, tell them about the great thing it is to be saved and have your sins forgiven, and it kind of lands on deaf ears, and you kind of, well, what's all this about? This ain't happening. Why aren't they so excited as I'm excited? And you kind of lose your zeal. Listen, you know what? What this world needs to see is Christians that are, are happy and full of zeal and want to serve God. That, that hymn, I never heard that hymn, The Best of All. That was a great hymn. You say, why should I give God the best, uh, my, my best of everything I got? Because God gave you the best he had in Jesus Christ, his son. Isn't he worth it? And we need a heart that's wise. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 8. So I don't know about you, but there's a lot of decisions that I'm going to have to make in the coming weeks, months, and years. And I'm going to need God's wisdom about it. I don't want to rely on my old wisdom. Because when I have in the past, I've made mistakes. And I need a heart that's renewed and has God's wisdom. So last night we looked at the natural heart, whether lost or saved and away from God. And, and again, this is not an, an, a complete list, but some things about having a renewed heart. And we can see there's a stark difference in the two, a big contrast in the two. I don't know about you, but to me, when I read Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence because out of the issues of life, It, it really drives the seriousness of how we need to keep our hearts right with God. I can't see into your heart, but God can. Last night, you know, we asked that, you know, we ended up with Proverbs, uh, Psalm uh, 139 and uh, to search your heart. In Ezekiel chapter 36, David cried out to God and said, God, create me a what? Clean heart, right? I, I pray that you ask God to show you if there's something wrong with your heart last night. If you haven't, you need to do it tonight. But then you need to, just like David did, ask God to create you a new, a new heart, a clean heart, a right heart, a renewed heart. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse number 26, it says this, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit. And I know it's talking to Israel. I know God's going to deal with him, you know, tribulation and so on and so forth. But you don't think God, your heavenly Father, who knows what your heart's all about, if he were to hear you utter that prayer, God, I want a clean heart. Help me to have a clean heart. He wouldn't honor that. I think he would. Because God knows how much, how important it is for you and I to keep our hearts right with God. 